dear participants, dear participants, my name is Yuha Saunamara, and it's my great pleasure, together with my co-host Marina Lomaeva, to welcome you all to an on an online workshop, Development of Sustainable Cruise Industry in the Pacific Arctic, Past Developments and Future Prospects. This event is based on an international cooperation between various actors, and it also serves as the 12th uh, Japan Arctic Research Network Center's open seminar. Our aim and agenda today and tomorrow are to discuss the trends in the development of the cruise industry in the Pacific and Arctic, its environmental, economic, and social sustainability issues, and uh, interregional cooperation in the area that we can call the Pacific Arctic. Dear participants, my name is Marina Lamaeva. I'm really proud of the lineup for today's session on the relationship between sustainable tourism and environmental protection. We have managed to assemble a group of leading experts from Japanese and Russian universities, research institutes, nature reserves, and NGOs who can bring diverse voices and viewpoints to the table. We have limited time for question and answers at the end of each part, and I would like to encourage all of you to send questions express your views and share your experiences through the chat. We will collect all questions and comments and deal with them today or later if there is no time to answer all of them during this session. As you have mentioned, this seminar is not an isolated event, but a part of a larger initiative aimed at building a network of actors interested in contributing to the development of sustainable cruise tourism in the Pacific. And before we start, I'd like to announce a few housekeeping rules. And as you can see, they are simple. So please change your Zoom ID to Latin letters and write your name and affiliation. Mute your microphones and turn your cameras off when you are not speaking. And please send questions and, uh, and comments through the chat. And please specify the speaker to whom you would like to address your question or mention that your question is for all the speakers of the session. Mm -hmm. This event will be conducted in English, Japanese and Russian. Please select the audio channel you prefer. And when you're giving your speech, please select the off channel, turn off interpretation. As you can see, we have a relatively tight schedule and we will have to be strict when it comes to the length of your presentations. Today's program is divided into two parts. We'll have a Q&A at the end of each part and a short break between the parts. And um, well, we will shortly introduce each presenter when it's their turn to give their speech. But now, without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Natsuhiko Otsuka from uh, the Hokkaido University Arctic Research Center to give his opening remarks. So, Professor Otsuka, please, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am from Hokkaido University Arctic Research Center. Deputy Director, my name is Otsuka. Um, it is an honor to have you all here at the 12th Open Seminar. This seminar has been designed to deal with various issues and pain points and changes that the communities in the Arctic area are facing. And we want to focus on the opportunities and combine both the academic and the real world perspectives to bring new viewpoints and also to provide support and opportunity. That means it is a combination of the academia, society and industry, and we will be picking up various topics in these sessions, and we have been doing that as well. And today, our focus is on the sustainable cruising industry and environmental protection, as well as the cruise industry and partnership with the local community in the Pacific and the Arctic area. And I will be touching on marine creations, cre creatures, sustainable tourism, 
and also our human resources development as well as Arctic Sea, North Pacific Sea, East Russian areas. And we will be receiving various interesting insights from our researchers and practitioners. And it is the JR Net ArcNet which is hosting this opening open seminar and Hokkaido University Arctic Research Center has been taking the leadership and we also have NIPR as well as JAMSTEC. And these three research institutions have partnered to come up with this research organization. And at the same time, in this specific seminar, we have the Russian Far Eastern Arctic Development Corporation, HR Development Platform for Japan-Russia Economic Corporation and Personal Ex Exchange, the HARP, and as well as the Japanese National Project, Arctic Challenge for Sustainability 2, ACTS 2, as well as U Arctic. And this is a co-host seminar, therefore. Today and tomorrow, we have prepared you full of insights, presentation full of insights. And I wish that this seminar would be helpful for the usage of sustainable usage of the Arctic Sea and also bring new partnership and corporations. So I hope you enjoy the two seminars today and tomorrow. Thank you, Professor Utska. We'll now proceed to open our first part. I would like to invite Professor Yoko Mitani from Kyoto University Wildlife Research Center to give her speech. Mitani, please, the screen is yours. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. I would like to change to the slide show. Can you see Please do not forget to turn on the interpretation. Be on the off channel, please. Is it okay? Can I start the slide? Marina, can I start? Yes, please. Okay. Please. Okay. So, um, oh, okay. I would like, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this online workshop. My name is Yoko Mitani, uh, studying marine mammal ecology and behavior in Kyoto University. Um, I was transferred from Hokkaido University to Kyoto University in October, but I will keep on studying marine mammals mainly around Hokkaido. Today, I will give a talk entitled Marine Mammals and Prospects for Sustainable Tourism. This photo, can you see this photo? So this photo was taken off Laos, the Nemro Strait, Eastern Hokkaido, Japan. You, can you see these killer whales? And the whales are known to visit this area from April to July, and whale watching is getting very famous in this area. So before I will talk about my mammals in Hokkaido, I would like to talk about oceanographic features around Hokkaido area. Hokkaido is here. Um, Hokkaido. Um, uh, Hokkaido is surrounded by three oceans, the Sea of uh, Japan, uh, Sea of Ohotsk, and Pacific. Uh, the Tsushima Warm Current uh, flows into the Sea of Japan from the south. And uh, when it crosses the Soya Strait between Hokkaido and Sahalin, and it, went, uh, it becomes the Soya Warm Current and moves southward. Uh, through the Sea of Okotsk. On the Pacific side of uh, Eastern Hokkaido, the Oyashio current, it's a cold current, flows from the north. The Oyashio area and the Sea of Okotsk are adjacent to the Russian waters and are highly related. So in today's presentation, I would like to talk about marine mammals in these two areas. 
Pacific coast of Hokkaido here is known to be very highly productive fishing grounds. This is a calendar of the fish season in the Kushiro market. Uh, Pacific sorry, mackerel, salmon, scalping, walleye pollock, and south seraphine sunfish, uh, slime flounder, Ohotsk mackerel, uh, cod, and so on are uh, caught in the, this Oyashio area. In this area, so residual harbors, residual residential marine mammals are present, like harbor seals. And nowadays, Um, oh, sorry, it's stop. Mm, to. Can you hear me? Yeah, we should stop sharing and start again. Okay. Uh, it's gradually yeah. repair. <laughs> um, can you he can you see the sierras? Oh, we can see the seal and the otter. Okay, <laughs> so nowadays sea otters have returned to this eastern uh, Pacific eastern coast of Hokkaido area. Oh, can you see this right? Yes, perfectly. Okay. okay, and we have conducted sighting surveys using uh, Ushio Maru, this ship. It is uh, uh, the training ship of the School of Fisheries, Hokkaido University. Uh, from Hakodate. Hakodate is here in southern part of Hokkaido and uh, through the Pacific coast of eastern Hokkaido and through the Nemo Strait to the Shiretoka Hanto, Shiretoka Peninsula area to the Sea of Ohotsk uh, in fall since 2009. This figure shows the locations of cetacean species encountered during the research, the research cruise in the waters. Um, can you see the those does papas, um, Pacific white-sided dolphin, kill whale, bears big whale, haba papas, bum whale, minky whale, humbug whale, blue whale is ones we saw here, uh, short fin pilot whales. And the, this figure is a little bit old, uh, so it is not included, but recently thing and say whales have also been seen. And Ohotsk Sea is seasonal sea ice area, and in Munda, it is covered by sea ice. This photo shows um, baby spotty seal. The seal, the seal uses this sea ice. The sea ice is very important for seals which use it as platform when they give birth. During the sea ice season, there are chores like this, using ice breakers in the sea of Ohotsk to see drift ice, drift ice and seals. And uh, Hokkaido is the southern tip, southern, uh, southern tip of the sea of Ohotsk. According to people who have lived here for a long time, sea ice has become scarce or thin in recent years, probably due to global warming. Uh, there are also reports of few sighting of baby seals, so further monitoring is important. We also conducted passive acoustic monitoring using the recorder in the Nemro Strait here. Uh, left figure shows uh, seasonal changes in the percentages of acoustic observations of marine mammals of Laos between November 2012 to, uh, and August 2013. From upper Pacific wide-sided dolphin, ribbon seals, uh, kill whales, and spam wells. Right upper panel shows the sonogram of vocalization of ribbon seals. I'm not sure you can hear, but 
Can. So this is, can you hear? This is the call vocalization of uh, ribbon seal. So ribbon seal is, ribbon seal is here. Ribbon seal is the one of the least understood species in the world. They are known to produce vocalizations like this during the breeding season. And their sounds are only heard when there is sea ice here in Feb only in February. Uh, the Nemro Straits are part of the breeding sites for them, but some people say that it is becoming rare to see the ribbon seal babies here now. So, and uh, I would like to show the killer whales. Um, killer whales, we have conducted surveys since 2010 and have been working on photo identifications, uh, recording underwater call and DNA analysis using biopsy sample. Our studies show that mammal eating type transient haplotype and the fish eating type, resident or offshore type exist around Eastern Hokkaido. So the, these are the samples from the Nimrod Strait, Abashiri and Kushiro. So the red shows the resident offshore haplotype and purple shows the transient haplotype. We also conduct satellite tracking. So we deploy the satellite tag on kilowells to something. Um, so the satellite tracking are also conducted off of Kushiro here is the Hokkaido, is the Pacific coast of Hokkaido and the uh, Nemro Strait here. So, and this 1501, deployed in of Kushiro, moved to uh, uh, move around this area and sometimes go to the north west northeastern and uh, come back to Kushiro and stay there for a while. And 1601 to 1604 wells were deployed satellite tag here in Nemro Strait and moved along the Okotsk coast of the Kriola Islands and sometimes go to the outside from the Okotsk Sea and move to the Pacific area and come back to the Okotsk Sea. So uh, the Nemro Strait is the oh, end for Kelwells as they move <laughs> along the Okotsk Sea coast of the Kriola Islands. So and this is probably why orcas live in deep uh, in such high densities in the Nemro Strait. So from siding survey and passive acoustic monitoring, seasonal shifts in the species observed in the Nemro Strait have become apparent. So in winter, you can see, uh, you can see the spotty seals and, uh, and uh, ribbon seals on the sea ice and the northern fossils come to this area from uh, in spring. Uh, minky whale and kill whales are also observed in spring. And spring, summer, fall, the dog's purpose here. And in summer, the sperm whales also come to visit. And then Pacific white-sided white dolphins come to this Nemo Strait in fall, and you can see the Stella Silans uh, in fall before sea ice comes. So these are migrant species, and you can, you can enjoy the watching tour here. So, so the Nemo Strait 
is included in Shiretoko area, uh, which was uh, registered as a natural heritage site in July 2005. You can encounter a variety of wildlife there. So ecotourism, uh, I believe that the next speaker, Professor Shikita, will talk about it, but is a new form of uh, non-consumptive educational and romantic tourism. It's okay. To relatively under, undisturbed and undersified and under visited areas of immense natural beauty and cultural historical importance for the purpose of understanding and appreciating the natural and social cultural history of the host destination. So this is from the Shirakaya Eto'o to 1999. And uh, so well watching is uh, ecotourism focused on whales and dolphins has become a popular activity. So the left panel shows the growth of whale watching worldwide. It is a little bit uh, old data, but from 1955 to 1998, the number of whale watchers are uh, increasing dramatically from 1990s. And uh, this is the whale watching tour in the Nemro Strait. So whale watching is also becoming popular in the Nemro Straits. Here, I would like to think whale watching is sustainable. So uh, it is reported that higher boat density that this uh, right upper panel shows the higher boat density corresponded with humpback whales frequency of uh, direction changes, which based on previous literature is believed to be a sign of disturbance. So the behavior of cetacean dolphins can be disturbed by human activities, uh, including the whale watching. Potential problems caused by disturbance may include behavioral disruption, displacement from critical habitat, and reduced reproductive success. Therefore, guidelines often developed in consultation with governments, scientists, industry representatives, and non-governmental organizations. So this light lower panel shows the uh, rules of the well watching. Uh, it is from the government of Western Australia. So those rules are determined by many stakeholders. And uh, the propeller and engine noise emitted by ships is known to have various negative effects on Sarasians and has become a problem. Ocean noise will disrupt sound communication, cause, cause stress, damage to hearing caused by loud sounds, and reduce foraging time due to escape from sound. If we are going to conduct well watching, we have to consider the effects of such underwater sounds. One minute left. Okay. So I would like to talk about the positive aspects of well watching. Citizen science is a new way to connective research, conceive research by involving amateur or non-specialized people. So these well, these white kill wells were found from watching, whale watching boat. At that time, no scientists were there in the Nemo Strait, but photos for identification were taken by the whale watchers, and they are very useful. So whale watching and citizen science have a strong affinity. Finally, I would like to summarize the prospects for sustainable tourism. It is required that long-term monitoring and consensus building forum among government scientists, industry representatives, and non-governmental organizations. And citizen science and its feedback will be required. I hope that sustainable tourism will contribute to the continued coexistence of marine mammals and people in the future. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Mikani. Uh, our next speaker is Asumi Shikida, uh, comes from the Japan Advanced Institute of Science and Technology and is a chair of the Siretoko Ecotourism Working Group and a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Siretoko World Natural Heritage Site. So, Professor Shikida, please, the screen is yours. Thank you very much for your introduction. Can you hear me? We can hear you, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful introduction. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Shikida from Japan Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I am also the chair of the Shiretoko Joint Ecotourism Management Committee, and I also have a committed to environmental management as a member of the scientific advisory board of Shiretoko World National Heritage Site. Today, I would like to demonstrate about the challenges of and the prospect for sustainable ecotourism at Shiretoko National Park. I believe this topic would contribute to the better environmental management of cruise industry in the Pacific Arctic. And it would be a food for thought for the development of sustainable cruise industry in the future. I mainly talk about tourism. Therefore, I believe it should be enjoyable for you to all. Next slide. Okay. Uh, let me start with by explaining the aim of this presentation. Firstly, I would like to share the big picture of Shiretoko National Park. It is also enlisted in World National Heritage Site in 2005. I explain what differentiates Shiretoko from others. Secondly, to show the current status of nature conservation and seaborne marine-based tourism activities in Shiretoko. And finally, to describe the participatory approach for tourism management in Shiretoko. I would like to continue my presentation by explaining my why sustainable tourism is crucial. The impact on the environment by tourism activity have long been discussed by researchers. However, it is not easy to know the practical relationship between tourism activity and environmental degradation. It certainly exists, but it is also invisible. However, impact on the environment, society, and economy at the destinations is serious. That cannot be ignored because we acknowledge that tourism attractions and resources would be maintained in sustainable status. We also, we also experience over tourism before COVID-19. Over tourism means that excessive use of tourism resources by tourists. This particular phenomenon will not be acceptable anymore. That's why we are interested in sustainable tourism. Sustainable tourism is sustainable practice of the tourism industry and the tourism activities. It started discussing after United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development in 1992 in Leo. Our tourism activity needs to be minimize the negative impact and maximize the positive ones. To maintain and enjoy the current status and quality of our environment. It is an alternative to mass scale conventional tourism. Uh, let's go on to this. It is apparent that the people are more interested in an enhanced sustainability after 1980s. The increase in the publication, academic publication started in the 1980s. Articles of sustainability doubled in every 8.3 years. Sustainability is our common interest. Back home, uh, this is a brief introduction of the Shiretoko World Natural Heritage Site. I will skip explanation of the geographic location of Hokkaido because Professor Mitani had already explained about it. Shiretoko Peninsula have an area of about 100,000 hectares and 65 kilometers in length and 25 kilometers in width. It covers two sides of peninsula proper. 
marine area is quite important, both for conservation and production of fish in this area. Marine protected area wise, it covers three miles of shore from the coastline. The coastal zone has been historically used by local fisheries here and in recent years by tourism activity as well. Uh, this particular biograph explains the natural setting of Shiretoku World National Heritage Site. It holds two remarkable features. Firstly, it is an example of a complex ecosystem showing land marine continuity. Drift ice are observed in coastal zone every year, as Mitan showed, Professor Mitan showed. It is at the lowest latitude in the Northern Hemisphere. Secondly, Shiretoko is a habitat for the diverse marine and the terrestrial creatures and the plants from southern and the northern origins. It is an, a crucial for the conservation of internationally important rare species. This biograph shows a brief history of nature management under the World National Heritage Scheme. Back to 1999, Shari and Laos local uh, town hall Mayors started to apply the world heritage. In 2004, Shiretoko World National Heritage Candidate Scientific Council was established. And in 2005, Shiretoko was enlisted in the World National Heritage List. The remarkable event was on site inspection by UNESCO World Heritage Center and IUCN in 2008. This action definitely contributed to the development of joint ecotourism committee and ecotourism strategy in 2012. Let's move on to the tourism activity in Shiretoko. Shiretoko receives more than 1.8 million tourists in 2000, 2019, just before the pandemic of COVID-19. Natural parks, national parks and protected area are often visited by conventional tourists. They enjoy watching wildlife such as bird, whale, and spectacular landscape along with the coastline. Tourism industry is an important sector, as you may know, for local economy in Shiretoko. In, it generates 12 billion N of tourism consumption every year. It's huge. Tourism generates one third of total regional production in this area. Growth of wildlife watching tourism is apparent. According to the INOSAI, the International Organization of Supreme Audit Institution, wildlife watching business is the world in the world hit 3.6 trillion and offering 8% of job worldwide. Uh, you can believe that or not. The contribution of the tourism sector to local economy and local community is remarkable. It is increasing in Shiretoko. This particular slide shows you the overview of tourism activity in Shiretoko geographically. In Shari, western side of the peninsula, it is a destination for conventional tourists. The town holds many onsen hot spring accommodations for tourists. They enjoy them. This is also the gateway to the Shiretoko National Park. In the coastal zone, there are bear and land landscape watching cruise boats. Meanwhile, town of Raos, located in the eastern coast, is a fishery-oriented community. They have few tourist accommodations. However, whale and seabird watching cruise boats are most popular activity in this side. Uh, this was shown by Professor Mitani as well. Uh, I can just give you a good example of tourism attraction and impact in Siretoko. Brown bears, as you may know, uh, most important tourism resources in Shiretoko because the bear is unique and hardly seen in other areas. Uh, this bureau shows you how tourists are attracted by this bear. Uh, this Chinese tourist say awesome and uh, she got excited when she ta was taken a photo. Apparently it is a stuffed bear. It is definitely safe. And she can do this freely, but if she can, but she cannot do this again if she tried to this action with a real bear. 
this shows that the trend in bear encounters in the park, the number of unsolicited encounters and and welcome encounters uh, increasing year by year. Uh, this was resulted in the repeated access of tourists to the bears. Even though the ecotourists, they are eager to cross to the creatures because it will give them more fun. In order to protect the tourists from the bear attack, park managers reluctantly shoot bears. I'm not quite sure how many bears are killed due to the direct access of the tourist. Regarding marine tourism, tourists love to see bears on cruise ship. Tourist operators often feed them to get the bird together, to provide more exciting encounters and experience with wildlife for tourists. Let me sort out the uh, current issue of tourism impact management in Shiretoko. Firstly, overuse of specific location occurs and underuse of less attractive locations last. This was caused by the rise of recreational, lighter type of tourism. Secondly, conflicts between wild animals such as brown bear and tourists are serious. Tourists are attracted by the large creatures and try to cross them. In response to them, animals are changing their behavior. Thirdly, increasing recreational tourists is likely to be the pleasure to the site. They are seeking a more exciting experience with nature set in nature setting so that they are likely to be more impact on the environment. Okay, let's go on to the management uh, scheme. Uh, this particular biograph tried to explain newly developed tourism management system in Shiretoko. Based on our agreement, we established Joint Ecotourism Management Committee in 2010, and it has been playing an important role to facilitate the discussion with diverse stakeholders. In other words, it is a common platform to exchange different and diverse opinions. In this scheme, site managers and management authority are not an enforcement body. They are becoming a stakeholder members. Expert team gives scientific advices to the committee as a side party. The action for the development of tourism strategies was triggered by on-site inspection of the UNESCO in 2008. They requested us to develop a comprehensive ecotourism strategy promptly. The strategy is expected to balance enhancement of conservation high quality natural experience for the tourist and the development of local economy at the same time. It seems almost impossible to achieve that for us at first. However, we committed to do it, to execute it in order to respond to this request. Stakeholder meeting organized by the park managers started from 2010. After two this years discussion- One minute left. Okay, thank you. We agreed to enact Shiretoko Ecotourism Strategies at the Joint Ecotourism Management Committee. Okay, this is a due process of ecotourism strategy. It's much like a Congress system. Uh, firstly, tentative solutions, either for permission of use and the regulation of use that are proposed by the stakeholders. And this topic will be discussed frankly and openly. They handed it to the subcommittee and if the proposal is sort of to be acceptable, it would be sent to JMAC again and discussed again for the collective decision making. If we agree that, we'll do that. Okay, let me give you a great example of this commitment. Uh, it is a case of conservation of seabird came free. Uh, they are endangered species in Hokkaido. It's a very lovely seabird. However, high speed water steaming around the nesting area and they are heavily impacted, have, have uh, impacted on have, uh, <clears throat> uh, on came free. Conservationists were upset and seriously worried about that. However, tourist operators ignore because they do not understand the value of the bird. It is just a bird for them, and it is simple. 
And as key and as a scheme of equity strategy, we had a serial meeting talking about this topic. However, the, there must be the limit of command and control management for this case. So that we tried to search creative solution to reconstitute this wicked problem. The solution we agreed upon was the support for the tourism sector. But why? Sorry, you're over your time limits. Okay, I'm going to wrap up my presentation very soon. What we did that we proposed them to use the KMRF for their tourism attraction. As a result, they become to know the value of it. Finally, two operators agreed upon the conservation because they finally realized the value of the KMRF. Okay, this is the implication. Uh, this is the end of this my presentation. Sorry about this, my poor time picking time keeping. Thank you very much for your active participation and listening. Thank you very much. Kira Sensei, thank you so much. Next, it is my great pleasure to invite Anastasia Kuznetsova, Director of the Commander Islands Nature Reserve, to deliver a speech. Please, the screen is yours. Good morning, colleagues. Unfortunately, we cannot hear you very well. Can you hear us? Can you see us? Yes, we can see you, but we can't really hear you. Uh, a second. I will try to increase the sound. I'll try to speak up. Yes, please, because the interpreters need the sound. Please, Anastasia, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to my Japanese colleagues. I represent the uh, Nature Reserve Komandorsky, the Commander Islands uh, Reserve. I'd like to speak about our experience of organizing environmental tourism. I am the director of this Nature Reserve and I've been working there for the past 10 years. We have uh, Mikhail, who is our uh, scientific officer and Anastasia is also uh, a person who participates in a lot of our, of our research programs. So the Commander Islands uh, Nature and Biosphere Reserve is one of the eight nature uh, reserves in Russia, 108 state nature reserves. We are the largest such nature reserve. We were formed in 1993. We are at the very end of the Aleutian Islands. Uh, for, admin for, for administrative reasons, we belong to Kamchatka and uh, you can see the map here, the nature reserve. Obviously, there are a lot of cruises. And before the pandemic and the good years, we used to have up to 3,000 tourists per year that visited the islands uh, on board the cruise ships. So we have a certain level of experience of organizing tourists. And I would like to share some of our practices. One of the main sites of interest is the Iri Kamen Island. You can uh, watch the seabirds colony there. Uh, it's possible to rent a small motorboat and tour the island. You can also find a lot of harbor seals and sea lions. The next site of interest is uh, the Toprakov Island. There's a tuft puffins colony. There's a special uh, bird watching platform. So at the end of summer, one can disembark onto the island and watch the birds. We organize tours there with cruise ships, but it's not just around the island, but also one can get off the boat onto the island. Another interesting site is the uh, Stellar's Arch. There's a very little river that flows through. If there's enough time, 
one can uh, go up the hills to have a look at the island and obviously tourists are very interested in that another place of interest of great interest to tourists is the Nikolske village I apologize Anastasia the interpreters ask you to speak up because it's very hard to hear you I'll try Anastasia says so the next place of interest is Nikolske village which is located on the Bering Island and we can offer tourists uh, a uh, local history museum which will also tell you about the modern life on the island there's a very small community there one can visit or agree to visit certain Aleutian historical sites um, there's uh, a performance that could be organized another place of interest is the uh, visitor center of our nature reserve we offer tourists a tour we explain what the nature reserve is all about we explain a lot of our activities and also we can organize a tea party followed by a story of how people live on the islands there's also a souvenir shop and a lo local people make different souvenirs in the tradition of local crafts uh, then there's also the north western rookery of marine mammals on the Bering Island one can watch uh, harbor seals uh, sea lions sea otters as well as uh, fur seals this is one of the uh, two large mammal rookeries on this island one can uh, follow a special trail in order to see it or it is also possible to approach it from the seaside on a boat another place of interest that we offer to our tourists is the Buyan Bay it is well known for its beautiful landscapes we offer the tourists not only to enjoy the uh, landscapes but in summer we can uh, show them uh, sea lions and uh, salmon uh, we also explain what the nature reserve ranger program is all about and in separate cases it's also possible to organize a tra traditional uka which is a, a clear fish soup another interesting place of interest that we offer to the tourists the sound is disappearing so there is no interpretation possible dear colleagues can you see us now yes we can see you and we can hear you very well because the sound was breaking up and uh, unfortunately the internet connection on the island is not very good so i apologize for this technical difficulty a minute please you want to go back to the presentation yes of course and we would also ask you to speak up even without the interpreters it's very hard to hear yes of course we apologize for that share screen no for some reason our presentation does want to load uh, one more attempt 
well, for some reason it's not working so if i may i would like to explain although it's working we could, we could see your presentation a minute ago or even a second ago yes okay very very well just a second then then please bear with us for another second well this is the uh, internet connection here we uh, had no airplanes uh, coming to the island in the past two weeks so there have been some storms so the commander bay the commander bay this is what i wanted to show you can see a uh, necropolis of the second kamchatka expedition participants and you can find uh, the grave of uh, vitas bering uh, there's one more place of interest it has not been yet uh, set up the Medni Island. This is the uh, second uh, biggest island in the archipelago. Very soon, we hope to be able to set up an exhibition explaining the way of life here on the island, about the Priabrazhensky village, and about the history of uh, exploration in this area. Another interesting landscape here is uh, the Sulkovska Cape. Uh, usually we do not have any disembarkments here. We uh, tour the island on a boat. Also the Medni Island has a rookery of marine mammals in the southeast. Uh, in most cases, we only approach them from the seaside, but sometimes it's also possible to organize the uh, disembarkation. And usually we have some research uh, researchers there who can explain what they do there and how the uh, watching of uh, mammals is organized. This is a government uh, protected nature reserves. Uh, therefore, there are a number of different special rules that apply to visits to this reserve and all tourists are supposed to follow them. It is important to obtain a permission from the nature reserve, but also it is necessary to obtain the permits from the Russian Federal Security Service and the Border Guard Service. Uh, and there's a signed agreement that is required. Uh, we also explain where one can go, which parts may be closed for various reasons. And every tour operator has to uh, look into those rules and follow them. I hope very much that uh, all the participants in this um, conference will come to visit our nature reserve. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. All the best to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, when, uh, our next speaker is uh, Roman Forchikin, Deputy Director for Research and Ecotourism, Kronotsky Nature Reserve. So please, Roman, the, the screen is yours. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I will share my screen in a moment. Can you see my screen now? Very well. So the Kronotsky Reserve State Institution manages uh, three areas in the Kamchatka Peninsula. The uh, Yuzhna Kamchatsky Reserve, the Kronotsky Reserve, we also have Karyaksky Reserve. The Kronotsky Nature Reserve is one of the oldest and uh, also one of the biggest in Russia. Our nature reserve is included in the uh, World Heritage volcano site of Kamchatka. We are engaged in the conservation efforts. Uh, we have a uh, research center and uh, obviously uh, awareness raising programs are run by our nature reserve. Uh, we have uh, environmental tourism as well. Our nature reserve was created in 1983 on the south end of the peninsula and we're included in the list of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. We have a number of rules that limit tourism here. The tourist routes of the Kronotsky Reserve uh, can be seen on this slide. 
obviously most of them are on land, but we also have a number of uh, sea routes. The majority of places of interest here and the majority of tourists go there are one are the places of interest that can be visited within one day. So we have one day tours mostly. Uh, the most famous place is the world famous uh, Valley of Geysers. Uh, also, we visit the Uzon uh, volcano and perhaps not as known, but often enjoyed by tourists, the Kronotsky Lake, the uh, graceful fir grove, and also the Simyachinsky Lagoon, which is approachable from the sea. This is a, a special shallow lagoon that can be approached by boat. As I mentioned earlier, one of the most popular one-day guided tours is the geysers of the Kronotsky Reserve. It usually takes a few hours. Since the uh, territory is uh, difficult to approach, uh, we engage helicopters for those tours. The geysers of the Kronotsky Reserve, a one-day guided tour, usually includes the visit to the Uzon's uh, caldera. On the south, in the so-called South Kamchatka Sanctuary, we have a number of uh, sea routes, uh, but again, uh, the most popular are one-day tours visiting the Kuril Lake. Uh, the Kuril Lake has uh, a lot of uh, sockeye salmon and uh, brown bears also frequent this area. We have a lot of volcanoes there and volcanic uh, landscapes that can be seen in this particular sanctuary. And uh, there's a separate tour, but we have very rare visitors there because it's very hard to reach area, although it can be also seen from the sea. Uh, the, this, we offer a service to Lapatka Peninsula. This is the southernmost point of the peninsula. Also, one can go to the Utashud Island but it is not possible to disembark there because the uh, rules for visits there are very, very strict. It's a rookery for the local marine mammals. So these are some of the guided tours that we offer. As I mentioned earlier, one of the most popular tours is a one guided tour, usually takes several hours. And the Kuril Lake is probably the most popular among them. One can also go uh, brown bear watching. Uh, it's always interesting to watch uh, how they fish salmon. In any case, even if it's a one day tour or if it's a multi day tour, one has to prepare for such tours and then the infrastructure needs to be set up. That is uh, important to ensure security and safety as well as comfort of tourists. It is also necessary to build certain infrastructure in order to preserve the local landscape, because we usually use uh, special platforms so that the tourists did not uh, destroy the uh, local uh, flora. So here you can see some of the numbers of visitors. As you can see that uh, the majority of tourists come within the three or four months of summer and approximately 90 percent of all the tourists come on one day tours by helicopter mostly to Kronotsky Reserve and South Kamchatsky Reserve. Now let's have a look at the sea tours. Here are some dynamics that you can see on this graph. And the number of uh, boats is not excessively big and the number of tourists is not so big so usually these are smaller yachts and cruise ships because some may think that cruise ships are huge liners with 2,000 people on board but no we're talking about smaller cruise ships uh, that bring not so many people and these are the kind of cruise ships that frequent our waters 
судах. By helicopter tours, by coming from Petropavlovsk, Kamchatsky, and from there they take a helicopter and arrive to our territory. Well, the opportunity to come and see the wild nature, the fauna of the sea, is a great attraction, and potentially can attract a lot of tourists. So we recognize there is a very big potential for further development, provided that there is adequate and wise management of those tourist flows. I guess there is big potential. And again, if you organize and manage the tourist flow in an adequate manner, and again, I would not expect some dramatic increase of tourist inflows, but nonetheless, one of the key advantages that we recognize in terms of development of that type of tourism, of maritime tourism, is the opportunity to see our waters and the nature without the necessity to seriously develop or create the infrastructure on the shore. Because the key request, the key expectation we have from our tourists is to see the wild nature and to see them in the actual wildness without the adjacent infrastructure. I'd like to specifically share some plans on the development of this territory. For a year now, we've been developing a tourist cluster, and the key peculiarity of this cluster is that the key infrastructure would be based in the adjacent territories and villages, just like in case of South Kamchatka Natural Reserve, when we see that the actual accommodation and the related infrastructure could be co-created with the business community outside of the protected areas by inviting tourists just for specific time, limited time, about several hours to visit our territory. And the remaining time, the tourists can spend their time in all the comfort at a well-developed infrastructure with a variety of services available outside of the protected area. So, like I said, it is our desire to make sure that tourists get their accommodation outside of our territory. And for that, we also would like to engage the local population and community to be active in the hospitality business, to make sure that our nature reserves is focused on uh, tourist activities related to the fact of providing guided tours. So that is our clear stance and intention not to become a tourist operator. We want to leave these opportunities and potential to the local community and local businesses so that they could create more jobs, more workplaces, make money and create this multiplier effect so that the business is evolving. No, в общем, большое спасибо. So thank you very much. And on this slide, you can see some contact information, and we would be very happy to welcome you at our nature reserve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roman. Uh, dear participants, I would like to encourage all of you to send questions, express your views, and share experiences through the charts. Uh, we have uh, one last um, speaker. In this part, Alexander Gruzdiv, director of the Wrangell Island Nature Reserve. Uh, and after it, we'll have a question and answer session, but it will be shorter than we expected. So please use the chat to ask questions. Alexander, the screen is yours. Какие розыски делаешь? Так. 
все понимаю, только у меня почему-то... Александр, вы говорите, да, вас не слышно. Александр, мы не слышим. Мы не слышим. Мы не слышим. Александр, мы не слышим. Александр, у вас микрофон выключен. Александр, ваш микрофон выключен. Пожалуйста, я не могу его Александр? Да-да-да, включил все. Yeah, hello, colleagues. Uh, now it's on. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you now. Please proceed. Can you see my presentation? Uh, please start the slideshow. Can you see it now? Well, not really. The slideshow is not really happening. But I guess it will just take a little time. Сначала вот у вас внизу там с текущего слайда, либо сначала и то и другое подойдет вот у вас под. So I suggest you just start this slideshow, go to the menu, into the file and main page to start the slideshow. Или в пять нажмите. Just press F5. I've done that. No, it has to be F. Five. I've done so. No, we still don't see the slide screen. Or you can just click on the button on the very left. Sorry, it looks like it was frozen. Just let me try to fix it. And I start the slideshow. Can you see it now? Well, I guess it should start any minute, but so far we don't see it. We can try and open the presentation from our computer. I stopped it so you can, if you can open it from your computer. So we can switch the slides for you if that would be comfortable. Yeah, great. So just give us a sign when it's time to move on over to the next slide. All right. So the Rangel Island Nature Reserve is a very remote territory that is hard to achieve with a total area of more than 2 million hectares. And the uh, sea area is around 1 million 400 hectares. 95% of all tourists coming to Chukotka are coming there with a the purpose to visit the Rangel Island. Uh, please let us know once we need to switch slide. Yes, please move over to the next slide. Yeah, thank you. So in the reserve, we have developed an, a number of tourist trails that you can see on the map. There is a circular route around the island that is covered by the cruises. The ones that you see in the reserve along the territory are land routes with some specific stops uh, where tourists can stay and have a more detailed look. Uh, we are only operational from August to September for visitors. Sometimes vessels do come a bit earlier, but normally there is ice. Therefore, in July, it's relatively difficult for the cruisers to arrive. Uh, so normally it starts in August. The helicopter tours do happen, but happen rarely because it is very, very expensive and difficult, and there is a, a great dependency from the weather. Sometimes they are cancelled in the very last minute because the weather changes and helicopters simply can't take off or land. As for the cruise trips, the vessels cover the island in a round trip in three to four days, and they stop at different parts of the islands, uh, offering also land tours of the territory of the island and also go to the Gerald Island, but that is only available from the cruise. Next slide, please. Like I said, the key types of tourism that we have are the cruise tourism and land tours. Next slide, please. 
And uh, this is an example of a sea vessel. Let's move over to the next slide. That's the cruise tours we offer to our island. And this is when you can get closer to the shore and see the walruses, sometimes polar bears. Sometimes you get to see the croakers of the walruses on the shore. And sometimes it is possible to have a closer look from the water. Next slide, please. And sometimes it is even possible to have encounters with a polar bears. That was a unique situation. We had more than 200 polar bears in one spot. And again, this is what you're likely to see on the reserve. Next slide, please. Uh, next one, uh, there are just some photos that would be nice if you scroll through them to give us a general idea of what kind of uh, fauna you're likely to see on the islands. This is how tourists embark, they're likely to encounter the polar bears or other mammals. Those are relatively large groups of tourists, you can slow down here. And uh, here you can also see this signs on the map of the reserve. Through the Wrangell Island, we also have the uh, Meridian 180 going through, and we also have a memorable um, uh, sign on that. Next slide, please. Uh, can we move over to the next slide, please? Yes, thank you. So that is the Herald Island. And this is only available for cruise tours. Next slide, please. And this is also a monument to the Paleo Eskimos camp. Uh, this is also a site for tourists. And next slide, please. And those are old hunters' houses that are located all along the shore. And those are the spots we normally use for embarking tourists. And we bring them there to show the history of the island. And next slide, please. So here, just some more information on those hunters caping that we turned old, almost into a museum. We tried to present the way that the hunters used to live and what was normally inside that type of habit. So the tourists are invited in to have a more detailed look. Next slide, please. Yeah. And this is a plus place, a, a monument where we had the first Russian flag officially raised. And this is a place where we commemorate this event and we invite tourists to see it as well. Next slide, please. So this is a Ptichi Bazaar Cape, or a cape where you're likely to see a bird's rookery. Uh, you can get very close uh, by a boat or a larger vessel so that you can cruise around this beautiful location. And this is a monument to a uh, vessel, Karluk, that was uh, destroyed here. The team had to get on shore here and the team had to spend the winter waiting for the rescue team. Next slide, please. And this is how the onshore tours are happening. We just put a small group on a car, about five persons. Uh, we're limited by the capacity of the vehicle here. And again, people feel better if they're in small groups. So it is a maximum of five persons in a group. So they travel around the island. Either it is a circular route or it is moving from one place uh, where they stay overnight to another place. So uh, logically, tourists do not normally stay in one spot for a long time. The most interesting part is moving from one place to another and meeting all types of animals along the way, uh, meeting polar foxes that we also have here, or the musk oxes. And that is a unique opportunity to enjoy the nature and take some photos. Next slide, please. In the nature reserve, we have developed specific rules for hosting tourists, and we make sure all those rules are complied with. We have conveyed them all to the tourist companies that are authorized to bring tourists to our reserve. We are able to host no more than two ships at the same time. Of course, the demand is very high. 
but we can't host any more than two. And we have just heard Professor Shakida mentioning a very important issue in uh, his presentation. This issue is also important for us. We need to make sure there is not too much haste, not too many tourists coming. Otherwise, it just spoils the whole atmosphere. And of course, we need to reduce the load on the water surrounding the reserve and the reserve itself. It is also important to bear in mind that normally people are coming to enjoy the wildness, the wild nature, and certainly they don't want to see plenty of people and vessels around them. So it is a delicate balance that we need to comply with. Next slide, please. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Yes, thank you. So those are the main tourist companies that we work with. Well, it's actually them working with us. They contact us and are willing to participate. So they just listed here. Next slide, please. And here we can see some statistic, the number of visitors coming. Obviously, the pandemic has in a way contributed to the protection of the reserve and resulted in reduction of the numbers of tourists. Well, here you can see the numbers before the pandemic and the numbers were growing steadily. Uh, the comparison between 10, 2016 and 2019, it was 250 tourists in 2016 and 2019, it is already more than 1,000. So the demand is very high and we forecast that it will grow up to two 2.5 thousand, but the pandemic has changed the situation a lot. And this year we hosted just 89 tourists. But nonetheless, even despite the pandemic, we had two cruises coming and a yacht came two times. Next slide, please. And here we can see the distribution by country. Those are the tourists coming to our reserve. This is a data for several years and you can see them here. Let's move over to the next one. And a few words on the infrastructure development. For those arriving by cruises, obviously care about the infrastructure less because they spend most of the time on the cruise. They just visit some locations and sports. But those who are going for winter tours, they obviously do need the infrastructure and we have several cabins or guest houses. Let's move over to the next slide to have a closer look. Can we have the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you. So you can see what we used to have, the cabin on the left, uh, tiny and outdated. And now we have constructed a new guest house. Uh, let's move to the next slide. So this is how they look inside. You can also find some more information on the website of the reserve. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. We will be very happy to welcome you at our nature reserve. Should you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them all. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, that was an excellent uh, piece. And now we have uh, a time for short Q and A questions and answers. And I can see that there is uh, one interesting question in the chat box, so I will read it. And this question goes to all representatives of the protected areas. And the question goes, are, uh, are scientific studies contacted to assess the impact of tourism and marine, and marine coastal ecosystems? Yeah, so uh, who would like to to answer? Uh, I guess this goes to Sire Toko, Commander Islands, Kronotsky and Wrangel Islands. So who would like to, to take this question? I think we have time for at least few comments. Would you like to? Commando Islands, uh, maybe you would like to take the floor? Or... 
Sukida. Yes, please. Please, please. Okay, thank you very much for your question. Thank you for brought that up. Uh, I have an uh, I have that same thought that is very, very difficult to monitor the relationship between the tourism impact and the tourism uh, degradation by tourism because it's long term and it's almost really visible. Uh, the tradition is we always compare the uh, present and the past status. If we confirm any change, we are going to carefully look at the change, how the change was caused. And uh, at the same time, uh, we also observe the uh, maybe rise and fall of the tourism activity and we carefully watch that. Uh, this is my answer. Thank you. Uh, I, I can see Anastasia uh, from Commander Islands. Would you like to comment, please? Anastasia, пожалуйста, вы можете говорить. In the nature reserve of uh, the Commando Islands, uh, please speak up a bit. Uh, in our nature reserve, uh, we are doing a lot uh, to observe uh, marine mammals, uh, all holdouts of marine mammals, uh, of the colons and uh, other sea animals. They are all uh, strictly monitored uh, by our the scientists, including uh, we monitor the weights. Uh, we monitor their numbers, we watch the dynamics, uh, we do watch the population uh, and uh, reproduction. That is, we are really studying the status of ecosystems. However, we do not have any targeted programs to trace uh, the impact of uh, tourism on the status of marine mammals. We don't have such programs so as yet, but we do have quite a significant effort that would help us judge the current status of marine mammals. And if need be, we can connect that to and relate that to tourism. But we also believe that the tourist flow is so insignificant in our case that uh, unlike our colleagues, we should not be really talking about any potential threat to um, animals from tourism and ecotourism. It is still premature. We are just monitoring the dynamics and populations of our uh, animals within our ecosystem. Thank you. May I ask a question, uh, Stanislav Belikov? Uh, I would like to ask the question to our uh, Japanese colleagues. Stanislav, uh, uh, could you wait a sec? Because I, I think Alexander wanted to comment on the previous question. Um, uh, before we give you the floor, maybe Alexander would uh, first take the floor to comment on the previous question. Thank you, Stanislav. Alexander, please. Alexander, please go ahead. Yes, I would like to really repeat what Anastasia said. Uh, we also do not have uh, many tourists uh, visiting us. So to assess and evaluate the impact on the ecosystems would be quite difficult. Maybe it could be done a bit later. And so we are different from our colleagues who experience thousands of tourists coming to their locations. May I also add to that, because I was kind of like kicked out of the uh, meeting, uh, my notebook ran flat. Uh, indeed, uh, it would be quite difficult to monitor the burden on the uh, nature. And Kronowski Reserve does not receive a lot of uh, visitors, although we are writing up uh, various guidelines and recommendations for tourist uh, agencies, uh, tour companies, uh, 
who offered two words uh, to the Kronotsky Reserve and also the petropavlovsk kamchatsky area, where you don't have uh, many of those nature reserves, but still you can provide some uh, instructions as to how to observe uh, uh, marine mammals uh, so that such observations would be harmless uh, uh, to them. Currently, we are developing and uh, a new, and uh, establishing a new protected area for marine mammals uh, to really reduce uh, uh, the anxiety and to create uh, opportunities in the proper locations uh, for the reproduction, for their haulouts, uh, uh, that is to protect them from the uh, fishing fleet uh, and uh, other uh, cruise noises. Stanislav, I'm sorry we interrupted you, and I'm sorry for interrupting others as well. Uh, our colleague, uh, our Japanese uh, cat colleague, mentioned uh, something about uh, sustainable tourism. This means that it would minimize this uh, impact on nature, on the biotic uh, components of the ecosystems. On the other hand, uh, uh, business uh, really wants to have some profit. Uh, and that's a long-standing uh, confrontation. Uh, in this sense, uh, we have developed uh, some uh, rules and regulations of uh, uh, visiting so that we can support uh, sustainable tourism. But what do you do about the areas, uh, say, like this, uh, uh, our colleague from uh, Vronovsky Nature Reserve, uh, areas uh, which are beyond our grasp. Uh, and uh, we may say that we prepare certain uh, rules and guidelines uh, for sustainable tourism, but you can follow those guidelines, or you may fail to follow them. So how our Japanese colleagues are uh, making sure that this impact of tourism would be minimal and how to make sure that tourism is sustainable. Thank you. If this okay. Uh, can you answer or comment? Can I have a comment? This is Shikida speaking. Please, please. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your interesting question. Yeah, I totally agree with you. There must be the limit of command and control method of management. Uh, instead of forcing tourist operator to curb their activity, there must be another creative solutions. That is uh, uh, reinvestment of their profit to the conservation uh, because uh, impact of tourism is unavoidable. If you use a nature setting, there must be the some sort of impact and we admit that and instead of uh, stopping the tourism activity we would request the tourist operators to reinvest or donate the, just a little bit part of their profit for the nature conservation if we reinvest from uh, their profit uh, our uh, nature conservation will enhance and progress. That is another option for or this for this wicked problem. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shikida Sensei. Uh, uh, Raman, uh, you wanted to say something, or we'll break because uh, we we are running out of time, unfortunately. Uh, um, we will have to stop our discussion for a very short break. Uh, please do some stretching, have a cup of coffee or tea, but remember to come back in four minutes, <laughs> five minutes, okay? We'll start, we're planning to start at 15.35 Japan time. Thank you for other questions we, or comments, we'll deal with them later. See you very soon. <laughs>